If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Now, when you talk about tick-borne infections, Lyme disease immediately comes to mind. However, there's a number of diseases that are transmitted by ticks in the U.S., and uh, they can be bacterial, they can be viral, they can be parasitic. Today, we're going to look at the diagnosis and treatment for several of these diseases. Joining me now is Massachusetts-based infectious disease physician and returning guest, Stephen LaRosa, MD. Dr. LaRosa, welcome back to the show. Uh, Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me back. Yes, sir. Well... Today, I asked you to come on the show to answer some questions about the diagnostic laboratory test for several tick-borne diseases and the treatments. And I want to go ahead and start with uh, anaplasmosis. And this may not be a disease that is very commonly known to the audience. Um, So what is anaplasmosis and what is the causative agent? Right, so anaplasmosis is confusing because it's not readily known to most people, but it, initially it was it was called ehrlichiosis, and it turns out there are two separate diseases. There's uh, human monocytic ehrlichiosis, which occurs closer to you. It's in the south-central part of the U.S., and that's caused by a bacteria called ehrlichia chaffensis, and that affects monocytes. Uh, And then there's what occurs up in my uh, part of the country in the Northeast, which is human granulocytic anaplasmosis, which is caused by anaplasma phagocytophilum. And so there are two separate diseases, and that and the the one up here in the Northeast infects the the neutrophils. And so when you're talking about anaplasmosis, uh, you're talking about the anaplasma uh, bacteria, and that's... um, uh, transmitted by uh, a tick, the exoides scapularis tick, the same one that transmits Lyme disease. Uh, and um, it, it causes a, a serious disease. It, uh, it incubates after the tick bite, uh, about a week to two weeks, a patient will develop nonspecific but very severe symptoms, including fevers, muscle aches, headaches, uh, nausea, vomiting, and uh, a characteristic dry cough. And in fact, uh, these patients often get called or characterized as a, a, a community-acquired pneumonia. And in fact, it's often, at least up here in the Northeast during the summer months, a very common cause of what we call an FUO or a fever of unknown origin. So it perplexes uh, the patient's primary care doc and the urgent care or ER staff where they present. Now, what specific or ancillary laboratory analytes or other medical tests are instrumental in the diagnosis of anaplasmosis? So there are, there are some clues uh, uh, on routine testing that you, you can pick up. One is uh, the patients characteristically uh, will have a, a low white blood cell count uh, known as leukopenia. Um, which isn't seen in, uh, often in other types of infections. Similarly, they'll often have thrombocytopenia, a low uh, uh, platelet count. Um, one of the hallmarks I've found is abnormal liver function tests, so the transaminases, AST and ALT. In fact, uh, if they're normal, if those, if those liver function tests are normal, it, it, to me it pretty much rules out anaplasma. And then the other uh, thing that you can pick up on uh, the CBC and differential is they, they have eight what's called reactive or atypical lymphocytes. We usually, we usually think of these 
as occurring in in mononucleosis right. like illnesses like CMV and in EBV, but uh, they occur in anaplasma as well. So that's those are the initial uh, diagnostic clues. Now, is there a specific test for anaplasmosis? Right. So specifically, when you uh, when you uh, suspect uh, the infection, the the best test is to actually uh, send off an anaplasma PCR, so to try to PCR the organism right out of the blood. You also can send a serology looking for antibody response to the infection with the IgM and IgG antibodies. However, uh, commonly it, it takes two to three weeks into the infection to mount an antibody response, and so it's not uncommon for the serology to be negative early on. Occasionally, you can get lucky in a peripheral blood smear, and you can actually see groupings of the organisms within the white blood cell. So in anaplasmosis within the neutrophil, you can see a, um, a grouping of organisms called the morule. Uh, and then in ehrlichiosis in the south-central part of the U.S., you can see the same in the uh, uh, monocytes. However, I have to tell you, it, it, my experience has been that's very rare, and you mm-hmm. don't hang your hat on that for for a diagnosis. So it's usually the uh, the PCR. Now, um, this is a bacterial infection. So, is antibiotics the treatment for this? Right. So the yes. Uh, so it's a bacterial infection, and the uh, treatment of choice is doxycycline. And and why that's nice is <laughs> it's the same treatment as Lyme disease, which is often uh, carried in the same tick, and you can be co-infected. So you can get you can get treat two infections for the price of one, so to speak. So doxycycline is uh, the treatment of choice. And the the nice thing is in anaplasmosis, within 48 hours of starting the doxycycline, uh, the patient usually feels uh, uh, quite a bit better. And in fact, it's almost a diagnostic test. Uh, in terms of if the patient effervesces within 48 hours, it's highly likely to be anaplasmosis. And if they remain febrile, then after 48 hours of doxycycline, then you usually don't have the right diagnosis, it's usually not anaplasmosis. And usually treat people who do have anaplasmosis for 10 days uh, with the doxycycline. Uh, in children, doxycycline use is, is not used in kids under 8 because of the staining of the teeth. Uh, and it's contraindicated in pregnancy. So the, the, the agent of choice in, in those settings of pregnancy and, and childhood is rifampin. Now, it, it, how about fatalities going along with this uh, infection? Is that pretty rare? It, it, it's fairly rare. I have to tell you, when the patients present with this illness, they look sick, and some actually uh, with the pulmonary inflammation can even go on to ARDS, but mortality is very, is very low. So it's a, it's a very, as a, as a infectious disease physician, it's a very gratifying illness because the patients come in and they look profoundly ill. And then, uh, within a couple of days of starting doxycycline, they're profoundly better. So, uh, uh, that's, that's the good news. Right. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to a, uh, another disease transmitted by the same tick and that's babesiosis. And this is different as it's a bloodborne parasitic infection. Uh, Dr. LaRosa, can you give some more information on the pathology of babesiosis? Right. So I, when I uh, see patients with babesiosis, I, I tell them, and uh, my, my name for it is American malaria. It, it looks all the world like malaria. It's a parasite that infects the red blood cells, the oxygen-carrying cells in the body, and actually causes them to lice. So you get profoundly uh, anemic uh, low blood counts, and when those red cells uh, lice, you get shaking chills and rigors and feel quite poorly. So it infects the red blood cells, and there's two ways uh, to get it. Uh, one is the, a tick, and it's again, it's the same tick uh, that, that causes uh, or transmits Lyme disease and anaplasma, the exoides uh, scapularis tick. So you can actually be unlucky enough to get all three infections, with the same tick bite, you can get one, you can get any combination of the three. And uh, again, it's a, it should be considered a hemolytic anemia with profound fever, and it can be uh, uh, just a, a summer flu-like illness in a, an asymptomatic person uh, 
um, a previously symptomatic and healthy person who gets over it in a couple of days or in an elderly person or one without a spleen uh, or somebody on chemotherapy. It could be a profound illness with multiple organ failure and even death. So it's a huge spectrum to how sick one can get uh, with this infection. Right. Now, as an infectious disease physician, uh, what laboratory test do you request for the diagnosis of this uh, uh, disease? Right. So the first thing is the, the clues again. So uh, usually the, the, the clue is that somebody has a new anemia. They previously had a normal red blood cell count and now they're anemic uh, because they're lysing red blood cells uh, and thrombocytopenia uh, as well, low plate account. And then you look in their chemistries for other markers that they're hemolyzing. And and the blood markers that help you determine if someone's hemolyzing include uh, lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. In fact, if someone's LDH is uh, normal, they're, they don't have babesiosis because it means they're not, they're not hemolyzing. Haptoglobin, which is a, blood, a protein that goes down in hemolytic anemia, uh, if that's low, that's supportive. Uh, AST, which we think of as a liver transaminase, is also in red blood cells. So if the AST is elevated um, more than the ALT, that's supportive. And then bilirubin, indirect bilirubin, which is released from hemolysis, that will be disproportionately high in babesiosis. So those are those are the clues that, that make you start thinking of this uh, infection. All right. and, and another thing physicians look for is uh, history. And in the case of everything we're going to talk about today is the history of a tick bite. Right. Right. So there's a tick bite, although oftentimes if it's a small tick, uh, like a nymph stage tick, they won't recall. Uh, I often in the history will ask if the, the patient has a pet because what I find is a lot of these patients have dogs and dogs carry ticks and they may not even be somebody who's very active outside, but it may amount to nothing more than walking walking their dog. The other thing to recall about the babesiosis is uh, it can be bloodborne. So uh, it, you can actually get it uh, as a consequence of uh, transfusion. Not all states screen the blood supply for uh, babesia, and so you can actually get it from blood transfusion. Right. Now, as far as definitive diagnosis, um you you went over a lot of the other markers, but finding the parasite in a blood smear would be definitive. Yeah, so you get a thin blood smear, and actually labs where babesiosis occurs are very good. In fact, uh, I can recall when I practiced in Rhode Island that uh, I'd get called about somebody who just had a CBC and a manual differential, and the astute lab technician would call me up and tell me that the patient had of babesiosis. So they're, they're usually um, ring-type uh, forms within the red blood cells or even um, tetrads of the organism, which is called a, a Maltese cross. That's a, what it looks like in the red blood cells. And those are picked up just on microscopy. Uh, it can be actually be very difficult to distinguish between babesiosis and malaria, uh, and that's why, where the history uh, comes in. You have to be assured that the patient has not traveled to a malaria uh, endemic zone. And so that's the treatment. You can also do a PCR, uh, but that can stay positive for uh, 12 months after treatment. You can send a serology, um, but the serology just means you uh, produced antibodies in response to the infection. It doesn't tell you about the timing of the infection, so it could be a remote or past infection and not be diagnostic of a, of a current infection. So it's really either a PCR or a blood smear. Most, most, most commonly, it's the lab calling with a positive blood smear. Right, and just to piggyback on that, I've seen this before on a blood smear, and the, and the Maltese cross formation that you mentioned is very, very distinct. And you'll never confuse that with a plasmodium, the malaria parasite. So, correct. Yeah, I have. I've not seen as many Maltese crosses as uh, I've seen the rings uh, in my in my time. But I'm I, I feel a lot more comfortable when I see the Maltese sure. crosses. Okay, uh, let's uh, jump to a message from our friends at Global Lyme Diagnostics. For many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. 
After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G L Y M E D X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Okay, Dr. LaRosa, how do you treat babesiosis? So, babesia is interesting because it, it's not the same treatment as anaplasma and. Uh, Lyme disease. So if you're just giving doxycycline for those and somebody has concomitant babesia, you're missing it. So the, the treatment, the best tolerated treatment is a combination therapy of azithromycin and atovaquone. Uh, azithromycin, 500 milligrams once a day, and atovaquone, 750 milligrams twice a day. The older uh, regimen uh, is clindamycin and, and quinine. And that's still the regimen in a, in a pregnant uh, female because of the longstanding um, um, success with using that safely in pregnant females. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, quinine is, is difficult to give because a lot of people develop tinnitus, uh, ringing in the ears, and you can get diarrhea with clindamycin. So it's a very hard regimen to take. So azithro and atovaquone is really the current standard. If someone is uh, severely ill with babesiosis, uh, you'll, uh, what I tend to do is add the clindamycin to the azithromycin and atovaquone and give triple therapy because it turns out, it turns out in time killed curves, uh, clindamycin actually has the most rapid killing of the organism. So I'll, when someone's in the hospital and they're severely ill, I'll give all three, um, agents at once. Okay. Um, now, you, you talked about the co-infections already, so we can see anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Lyme disease all transmitted um, in the same tick bite. Now, as a physician, i got about two minutes left, Dr. LaRosa. Yeah. How, how does this complicate the diagnosis and treatment? Does it make it that much more difficult for you? No, I, when I see someone with babesiosis, what I do is I treat the babesiosis with azithromycin plus or minus clinda, and then I will add doxy until the Lyme uh, screen and the anaplasma PCR uh, is back. Um, in uh, anaplasma or a Lyme disease, when I see somebody with those, I, I know that I'm covering both of those agents with doxy, and then if there's no evidence of hemolysis, then I don't empirically treat them for babesia. But you have to just be aware that all three are possible, and any combination of the three uh, are, are possible, and and not to not to miss co-infection. Okay. Well, an, another tick-borne illness, which is viral, that's gotten a lot of attention this summer, is Powassan virus. Um, and this is transmitted by the same tick as uh, uh, Lyme disease also. Am I right, Dr. LaRosa? That, that's correct. It's, it's transmitted by the exoides tick, and it's considered uh, in what's called an emerging infection. So uh, it's been seen in Ontario uh, in, around the Great Lakes, and we're seeing more and more cases actually in Massachusetts as well. And the scary thing, if you will, is, is it's a viral infection. It's a member of the flavivirus family, and there's no specific treatment. And what differentiates this infection from uh, Lyme disease, where it takes, uh, you know, about 36 hours of tick attack attachment to transmit, you can actually, uh, a tick can transmit Powassan within 15 to 30 minutes of attachment. Uh, so that's what's particularly worrisome. Dr. LaRosa, I think you even mentioned it to me that you have treated Powassan virus patients in the past. And this is a pretty serious disease. You have fatality rates, though I don't know how significant it is because there's been such a small amount of patients at around 10 or 15 percent. Um, what diagnostics do you rely on? Right, so the first is when you suspect it. So obviously there's the epidemiologic exposure or potential exposure to ticks where uh, 
up where I, I, I practice, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much everyone. But uh, these people will present with fever and weakness and often paralysis. And at least in uh, the, the few cases I've had, the uh, cranial nerve abnormalities involving the eyes, so double vision, ophthalmoplegia, tend to be uh, hallmarks. When you think of it, you can actually send um, either serum or spinal fluid for serology, uh, particularly IgM, and it's sent to the CDC. Uh, and that's, uh, unfortunately, it takes uh, still quite a few days for that result to come back. So, unfortunately, the patient's either better or uh, much worse by the time you even know what you're dealing with. Um, in terms of clues, with the spinal fluid, uh, it's usually a lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis, so lymphocytic predominance in the spinal fluid with an elevated protein. And then there have been some uh, uh, findings on MRI uh, of the brain uh, with enhancement in the in the in the midbrain and the as well as the basal ganglia as as well that could be clues. But it's frustrating because it takes so long to make a definitive diagnosis. And again, there's there's no specific treatment. Um, however, uh, in the case series that have been published, people have tried corticosteroids uh, with some success uh, and uh, or IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, with some success. But there really is there there are not enough cases right now to really know what the definitive best therapy is. Right. So it, it's like most viral infections; it's mostly supportive therapy. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, uh, we we already kind of mentioned that uh, Powassan is also transmitted by the same tick as the three previous uh, uh, diseases we talked about. So it's theoretically possible to have a co-infection with four infections. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Uh, although you can have Powassan isolated uh, by itself because of the the rapid time to transmission. Uh, that's what makes this, in my mind, uh, really scary: is that the tick doesn't have to be on for long. Do you do you believe that uh, if this virus becomes common enough, the 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 average clinical laboratory up in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or Connecticut will start providing testing for this? I think that's right. I think uh, the, they'll be more centralized, and you won't be dependent on waiting for the the test to come back from the CDC. The other thing that uh, I've thought about is: will this go the way of what we saw with West Nile? Virus. I can I can remember years back when I was seeing a, quite a number of West Nile virus infections, and then what develops over time is is somewhat of a, a herd immunity, uh, a population immunity, and you and the and the uh, uh, the infection tracks westward, if you will, and you don't see that many cases anymore. And it may just be a matter of time where the population has a certain density of. Uh, of protective antibodies, and we don't see it anymore. And you're seeing it in other parts of the country. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and move on to uh, another tick-borne uh, disease, uh, which can be uh, pretty fatal. And um, it's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and some of the audience may have heard of it before. Do you see Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever in Massachusetts? Uh, we do. Uh, you know, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is kind of a, a, a you know, the name is kind of misleading, right? Because right, where most of the cases are are not in the Rocky Mountains at all. In fact, uh, they're in the south central and southeast part of the USA. They're in predominantly in Arkansas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, the Carolinas. But in terms of in the Northeast, uh, Massachusetts is right up there. Uh, so we do see cases. They're usually in the southeast part of the of the uh, state or in the Cape uh, Cape Cod area. Uh, and again, it, it is a tick-borne infection. It's a it's a dog tick, so not different from the deer tick uh, that we we see in uh, uh, with Lyme and the other co-infections we just mentioned. And it's usually a, a, a spring summer month uh, transmission. Now, this is a very serious tick-borne infection, and uh, timely treatment is of the essence. Um, can you talk about the symptoms and the pathology of Rocky Mountain spotted fever? <laughs> 
Right. So this is a, a very small gram-negative rod, and the way it causes its pathology is by damage to the, the what's called the endothelial lining of the blood vessel. So it's a vascular injury. It's a systemic injury, so it can, it can cause lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So somebody's on the ventilator. It can infect the, uh, the heart, so myocarditis, the brain. Um, it would, the damage to the blood vessels can cause what we call a coagulopathy. Uh, and so you're getting um, damage to the blood vessels, and you can actually see that in the skin. So the, the symptoms are, are fairly nonspecific. Uh, there's a high spiking fever. There's chills. These people usually have severe headaches and muscle aches. And then uh, a few days later, and not in everyone, but a few days later, they'll develop uh, this hallmark rash where they have red macules and petechia that typically begin on the wrists and ankles, but sometimes in the hands and feet. And then they spread centrally, so up the arms to the trunk uh, and the chest. And the, the rash can be a little bit uh, confusing because there are some other serious illnesses that can look just like it, such as disseminated gonorrhea, gonococcus, and uh, a life-threatening illness in young people called meningococcemia. So uh, you really, again, you have to get the history of the exposure as well as, um, you know, sexual history uh, to rule out gonorrhea. And meningococcemia is usually young people who are in close quarters, so in the military or colleges, who haven't been vaccinated. So you really sometimes have to drill down to what it is. And uh, waiting for laboratory confirmation is not always feasible because uh, this can be, this has a pretty rapid acute uh, uh, infection. Um, so treatment is, right. yeah, I mean, you got you to gotta treat them even before you get lab results if you suspect Rocky Mountain spotted fever, right? Absolutely. So, so some other things on the labs that could be helpful. You can actually have evidence of the uh, uh, coagulopathy with a low platelet count and an increased D-dimer, fiber, and split products. One of the things that can be very helpful, and uh, I, uh, it's probably due to increased ADH release, but rickettsial illnesses are, are, are famous for causing hyponatremia, very low sodium. So that can be mm. helpful. But you're right. The, the diagnosis is usually made with serology, which takes a while to come back. You can do a skin biopsy and look for the organisms. That also takes time. And you're absolutely right. If you delay treatment, um, th- there's good data that the mortality uh, goes up dramatically if, if treatment is delayed for more than five days. So it is one of those illnesses where if you're thinking about it, you have to start treatment, and the treatment of choice is doxycycline, uh, re, uh, and uh, ask questions later. So you think of it, again, it's another doxycycline-treatable disease. Right. Um, the next tick-borne illness I'd like to talk to you about, and I didn't realize this was actually reasonably common up in Massachusetts, it's tularemia. Um, and it's it's seen in a lot of different states, and it's usually associated with rabbits or uh, hunters and that kind of stuff. Um, so, so, Dr. LaRosa, can you talk about tularemia, like how it's transmitted to humans and the diagnosis and treatment? Sure. So tularemia, uh, a gram-negative organism, uh, caused by a gram-negative organism called Francisella tularensis, and there are multiple modes by which you actually can acquire this. It can be uh, through, most commonly, through uh, 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 a tick bite, an arthropod uh, bite. Uh, you can actually get it from uh, handling uh, infected animals, uh, such as rabbits, as you mentioned, uh, ingesting, so you can actually eating uh, infected uh, animals, or even inhalation. Um, in fact, uh, this is one of the agents of bioterrorism because uh, you could, it's a very contagious illness and it's possible that uh, uh, it could be aerosolized and infect a whole group of people. And the manifestations that you get really depend on the mode by which you acquired it. So the most common is what we call a, an ulceroglandular fever, so a high fever with a, a skin ulcer usually on an extremity with an associated swollen uh, lymph node. That's the most common. You can get a typhoidal form from ingesting it. Uh, you can get an oropharyngeal form from inhaling or ingesting it, and a pneumonia 
from in, uh, inhaling it. Uh, and it's very common in Massachusetts, and the, and the epicenter is really Nantucket, um, um, uh, one of the islands off of Massachusetts. But you, there, there are other states where it's uh, very characteristic, uh, very common, including uh, Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So, so have you ever treated any patients with tularemia? Uh, one of the first cases I had as, a, as an infectious disease fellow in Boston, uh, I'll never forget it, was a, a, a relative of a VIP who had come from the Cape, and fortunately she had a classic a form of a ulceral glandular. She had a she had come from she had come from Nantucket and she had an ulcer on her arm with a, a big axillary lymph node and a high fever and so uh the diagnosis was pretty readily apparent. Okay. And uh lastly, um I'm gonna just kinda give you the floor on this and see how much you want to talk about it. Because we've talked about this in the past and that's Lyme disease. That's the the granddaddy of tick borne diseases and um if uh, just want to go ahead and give you the floor, Dr. LaRosa, if you want to talk about anything about concerning diagnosis and treatment of this very common tick-borne disease. Sure. So we, we've ta- talked about this before, but there are some things as I thought about it. Uh, one is um, uh, a question that comes up probably uh, uh, a few times a week in my practice, which is uh, to treat or not to treat a tick bite. Uh, and it turns out for, for Lyme disease, the tick really has to be attached for about 36 hours uh, to transmit the infection, uh, to transmit Lyme. And it, and it really, if it's not engorged, if the tick is not engorged on your skin, it's very unlikely uh, that it's going to have transmitted Lyme. And uh, if, but if it has, uh, doxycycline 200 milligrams as a one-time dose is, is very effective uh, at, at, as a prophylactic uh, medication. Um, but I think lots of people get exposed to antibiotics for prophylaxis when it's probably not needed. Uh, the other thing I've, I've thought about is uh, because we see a lot of people who've had Lyme uh, serology sent for very vague uh, aches and pains without focal arthritis, fatigue, um, and uh, think about Lyme is there, it's very characteristic in its phases. You know, there's phase one with the characteristic rash and a flu-like illness. Uh, then there's phase two, which is an early dissemination where somebody has a, a focal objective, uh, a neurologic uh, deficit or meningitis or swollen joint or heart block. And then there's late phase three where they have a chronic arthritis with focal findings and objective findings on testing of their, their central nervous system. But, um, you know, those are the hallmarks of the three phases. And I, I unfortunately, all too often, I think we, we see serologies being sent on people with very nonspecific uh, illnesses, and that, that shouldn't be done. Um, the other thing is when someone has a, a, the early phase, the erythema migraines, rash, very often their serology will be negative, and the recommendation is just to go ahead and treat them uh, for that uh, so you don't have to send any uh, tests. Um, most manifestations of Lyme can actually be treated very well with doxycycline. You don't need uh, IV uh, therapy uh, except if somebody's hospitalized with a, a heart block or a, a very focal um, uh, severe neurologic complication like uh, meningitis uh, or, or radiculopathy, uh, you don't need it. Um, for for late uh, CNS or encephalopathy cases, you really need to try to get objective finding like findings like formal cognitive testing, MRI findings, and CSF uh, antibodies. But uh, again. Uh, I think the big takeaway is no screening for healthy people who are asymptomatic with non-focal findings. And let me ask you one more question before I let you go. In your practice in Massachusetts um, in 2017, are you seeing an increase in tick-borne infections as compared to previous years? Uh, it's seen, uh, so I've been uh, between practicing in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts so for the majority of the last 12 years. It seems like there are more and more uh, every year. And, and in fact, I have to tell you, Lyme gets 
gets all a lot of the pub, right? It gets gets all the uh, attention. Sure. The people I tend to see in the hospital uh, with tick-borne infections don't tend to be people with Lyme disease. They tend to be the anaplasmosis and the babesiosis. Uh, those tend to be the people who do often get infect, uh, admitted because uh, anaplasma will often be a, a fever of unknown origin that stumped uh, their, um, their primary care doc. And babesiosis, they may actually have multi-organ failure I didn't mention that if you have a if you're severe enough with a high enough parasite level, uh, an organ failure with babesia, you sometimes need what's uh, called an exchange blood transfusion, where your whole blood volume is is replaced with plasmapheresis. But um, uh, the thing to recall is, you know, we talk a lot about Lyme, but the other uh, the other infections can be just as severe and. Uh, um, and have to be taken that way seriously. And you're saying that most of the hospitalized patients you're seeing have one or the other ones, anaplasmosis. Yeah, they don't, they, is that, they don't is, usually have Lyme. Right. Is that, is that because that's just more of an acute type infection or? Yes. I mean, you can treat lots of people with a, a Bell's palsy um, or a, uh, an arthritis, uh, an inflammatory arthritis with Lyme with doxycycline as, as outpatients and erythema migrans. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, we, we do see a few people with heart blocks who come in and who resolve pretty quickly with IV uh, therapy. We do get a smattering here and there of Lyme meningitis, but uh, uh, it's not often that you see these folks get admitted. Okay, well, very interesting. I want to thank you once again, Dr. Stephen LaRosa, for spending your time with us and uh, discussing infectious diseases. I appreciate it, sir. Yeah, well, thanks again for having me on. You bet.